where all the action is. Okay, as people continue to wander in, um, since I only have 35 minutes and there's a 50 minute talk or an hour long talk, I'm gonna have to get started. Uh, my name is Dan Walsh, I lead the container, t container team at uh, Red Hat. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, new container technologies that we've been developing over the last year, year and a half. Um, the way I'd like to start this talk is first of all, uh, anybody who went to see Scott's talk yesterday about container technology, a bunch of you. Um, so this is shirt is a fairly popular shirt of Red Hat, um, and a lot of times we talk about containers, um, and the way I like to describe containers is they're just simply processes on a Linux system. Um, and if you, uh, one way to describe containers is to say that they're um, processes that are controlled by three things. One of them is C groups, so resource constraints, basically taking a group of processes, um, putting in things like memory, CPU, utilization, and trying to control how much they use so they don't affect other groups of processes on the system. The second thing to think about when you talk about containers is security constraints. So basically I want to make sure that this group of processes doesn't interfere with this group of processes, so there's no uh, escalations, things like that. Um, and then the third thing you think about with containers is stuff called namespaces. So namespaces gives you that virtualization feel. So it's sort of, uh, uh, there's a PID namespace. As soon as a process chooses to join a PID namespace, it loses view of all the other processes on the system. Uh, similar to mount namespaces, uh, Enjoying a mount namespace, everything you mount from then on is not seen by your parent. So your, your mount table starts to diverge from where your parent's mount table is. Um, so those are the three things that basically make up containers. So C groups, some kind of security constraints, and then namespaces. If you boot up a modern Linux system, a RHEL, uh, like a RHEL 7 system or, or newer, um, you would see that PID 1 inside of a, uh, you know, the system D that boots up the system, if you went and looked at it, you would see that uh, you could cat out proc one slash C groups, and you would see that PID one is inside of C groups. That C groups associated with it. Um, if you cat it out, uh, if you went to proc one, um, and, and you could see that it's, you know system D is running with SE Linux constraints. It has use, users associated with it. If you cat out proc one slash status, you'd see capabilities associated with it. Um, so lastly, if you went to proc1 slash ns, you would see the namespace is associated with PID1. So when you boot up a Linux system, everything in the Linux system is in a C group, has security constraints, and has namespaces. So by the definition of that, be, those things being required for a container, everything on a Linux system is a container. And that's why the shirt says Linux is containers, and on the backs it says containers of Linux. So really, the whole uh, Linux system is built to build these containers. Now container runtimes are all about basically modifying those constraints. So further locking down what a process is able to do um, on the system. So lastly, when people ask me, can I do that in a container? Can I run this in a container? I always say, can you run it on Linux? If the answer is yes, then you can run in a container. Okay, so we're going to talk about next generation, but let's start by doing this. Please read it out loud, all text in red. This is excellent. Excellent. Okay, so since we're trying to do this talk without using the Docker word, we have to put out the swear jar. For those that are maybe native to the U.S., a swear jar is what 
um, in American households, when you're a child would say a square, they'd have to put a quarter or some, some amount of money into a square jar. So if I say the D word during this, I will have to put uh, uh, money in there. But the, re the real point of this is to, to point out that sort of the, the, the D word has sort of dominated the conversation, and it's really just one form of, of doing containers. And I believe in a lot of ways, because of that, we've been sort of hindered. Right, five years ago, um, and I'll, I'll say it now, um, Docker came along and um, they, uh, you know, they sort of revolution. They got all this container stuff to, to take off, and um, all of a sudden it became the only way of doing it. And just, just but a containers are nothing more than process on a Linux system. Um, and, and because of that, we've had some hindrances, in my opinion. And what I want to look at is new tools to, to be able to do this container te technology and be able to expand it. So um, when I look at it, uh, what, do, what do you need to do to run a container? So what, what does it mean that I want to run a container on a system? Uh, break it down, you know, what I'm trying to do here is break it down to its, its core components. So when I want to run a container on a system, first of all, I have to identify what a container is. Okay, and that's really sort of, you know, what is a container? What is a container image? So most people, when they refer to it, are actually referring to container images, right? I want to pull something from Docker.io. That's a site. I don't have to pay for that one. Um, so, you know, they want to pull some kind of application down. And, and what happened, the real start of the uh, Docker revolution was that they standardized on this concept of an image. And what an image was is a tarball in some JSON file. So what you do is it created what's called a rootFS. A rootFS is just a directory that looks like root on a Linux system. And then I, I create a JSON file that basically describes what's in the rootFS. Then I tie the thing up together. So I use the you know, tar tape archive tool in Linux and I tie those up. Now I can have what's called layered images, which is basically I'm going to install something on top of that rootFS. So I tie up the first one and I install something new. Now I tie up the difference from the original code to the new one in a tarball, and I created another JSON file that modifies the original JSON file, and I tar that up, and that's a layered image. Okay, so they're just nothing more than tarballs and JSON files, and, and you know, the next thing you do is you take these tarballs and you put them out on a website. And in this case, we call that website a container registry. So a container registry, and then we build a protocol to pull those images back and forth. So when we came out with these, these tarballs, originally, um, there was no standard, right? There's no standard for it, and everybody was just using the de facto standard, basically what Docker did in, in the beginning. And um, so what they did in the beginning, everybody was fine with that for a little while, and then all of a sudden CoreOS came along. And CoreOS had a different technology. They had a technology called Rocket. And what they wanted to do with Rocket is they wanted to be able to support app, their own application container images. And, and what they decided to do is they came out with a, they wanted to standardize on it though. They didn't want one company to be able to control um, what it is. And if you think about the problems of controlling what the data, the data images, just think of Microsoft. So Microsoft came out with, you know, doc format back in, you know, back in the 1990s. And what Microsoft would do is every single release of their operating system, they would basically change .doc format. So all of a sudden, people couldn't send documents around unless you bought the latest Windows or the latest Office products, right? So if you had Windows 95 and all of a sudden uh, Windows 2000 comes out, all of a sudden you, people would build documents on Windows 2000 and you wouldn't be able to view them on Windows 95. And of course, Microsoft also was able to get like LibreOffice and OpenOffice and all these other tools weren't able to interoperate. So what we wanted to do is get a standard a standard application. And CoreOS said we have to have a standard on what this image format was. And so they came out with the AppC spec. Now AppC spec was different than what was the Docker image. So there was a problem with that. I prepaid for the next one. Uh, so the, 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 so all of a sudden, the big industry companies like Red Hat and Microsoft and, and Google and uh, IBM basically said and said, this is going to be bad. What's going to happen here is all of a sudden there's going to be multiple different specifications. So if you want to build applications that are going to sh ship in the future, you're going to have to have an app C version. You're going to have to have a 
darker version. That was my second one. Um, and so we really want, didn't want everybody having to ship different type of container images. So everybody got together and said, we're going to form a standard, and that was OCI. So OCI stands for Open Container Initiative. It was a standards body originated by um, Red Hat, Docker Rank. Don't have to pay for that. It's a company. Uh, and Microsoft, uh, IBM, uh, Google, and maybe uh, CoreOS, and Red Hat, and maybe a couple others. But anyways, they got together and they stand it. And as of last December, they came out with the OCI image bundle format. This basically defined what goes in an image. So a lot of times when you talk about images from now on and say it's calling on the D image, call it an OCI image. It's a standardized image form. It's based on the original D image. Uh, but everybody agreed to do that. So CoreOS actually triggered this long before they were acquired by Red Hat. So the next thing you need to do, oh, segue. Uh, next thing you need to do is basically pull down an image. So this is a, one of the tools I'm introducing today. It's been around for a couple of years. It's kind of weird I'm introducing it now. It's called Scopio. How many people have played with Scopio? Okay, good group here. Uh, Scopio was introduced a, a few years ago, and the, the whole idea is, originally what we wanted to do is basically go out to a registry, container registry, and look at that JSON file associated with the registry, uh, with the image. Um, and if you think about some of these images, I've seen JBoss images that are like hundreds of, of megabyte size, you know, size, getting up near gigabyte size of these images. So the only way right now with the D tool to look at one of these JSON files associated with an image is actually to pull the image. So do you want to pull a couple hundred megabytes just to look at, into, at, at this JSON file that describes the image and basically say, oh, that's the wrong image, now you've got to throw it away. So what we wanted was basically to be able to do a de-inspect remote, dash dash remote. We put, did a pull request to upstream and they said, no, we don't want to clutter up the CLI. What we want to do is, he said, he said we don't want to do that, but he said, it's just simple. It's just a web service, just do web protocol and you can pull down the JSON file. Build your own tool to do it. So we built a tool for that called Scopio. So Scopio, which means in, in Greek, remote viewing, uh, was a tool to basically look at a remote site and just pull down that JSON file associated with the container image. Um, so the guy that did this um, on my team, uh, Antonio Merdaka, um, actually decided to do, go further. So originally he just did uh, you know, inspecting images to pull down that. But then he started to say, well, I can build the entire container your image protocol, right, the ability to pull these images uh, back and forth between registries, and he basically built Scopio into a tool that could move images around. Now, Scopio has become really cool because it can actually transition from different formats, so you can actually copy down an OCI format, store it inside of a, uh, inside of, um, uh, inside of a Docker daemon. You can actually pull it to local form, local directories. You can translate from the original image format to the new image format. But the really cool thing is you can actually move images from one um, container storage to another, or one container registry to another. So a lot of people now are using Scopio to actually move images around their environment. And we're getting a lot of uptake in this. So we were working with CoreOS to try to get CoreOS to embed Scopio into Rocket, and they said they don't want to embed a tool, a CLI tool, into Rocket. What they wanted to do is basically just use the library that Scopio was using. So that library became Containers Image. So GitHub Containers Image is now a library for moving these OCI images and uh, old-fashioned images back and forth around the environment. You move them between registries, and you don't need to have any root-based tools. So you can basically sit there as a user and say, copy from, say, my internet-based uh, container registry and copy into my internal container registry or copy the files locally. So it became a mechanism for moving that image from the registry to the host. The next thing we needed to do was basically take that re that image and basically explode it on disk, right? In order to run an application and container, we have to have that rootfs reestablished. So we take down those one or more layers and reassemble them. The way you do that in Linux is what's with things called copy on write file systems. Okay, and you might have heard of Overlay, Device Mapper, ButterFS, there's a whole bunch of them. So we t basically took a lot of the tooling that uh, we had worked with with the upstream and built it into a little tiny library called Container Storage. So this ability to explode images onto a copy on write file system, 
And the last thing you need to do when you run a container, want to run a container, is you actually have to basically, what does it mean to run the container? And luckily, OCI is standardized on that. So there's a standard mechanism for running a container, and that was uh, also specified last year, by the beginning of, uh, yeah, last year, is the OCI runtime specification. So an OCI runtime specification says, that I pull down the image, and that image had that JSON file that tells me how to run the container. Well, I also have input from the user, and I might have input from whatever tool is putting this all together, and I basically want to take those three inputs and combine them together. So user might come in and say, I want to run in privilege mode, or I want to run without this capability, or I want to volume mount in this stuff. Um, so we need to take the user input, the application that's setting it all up, or the container, what I'm going to call a container engine, Engine, and then the last step is actually to take the, the stuff from the image and it munges all that together and basically writes out another JSON file. So that JSON file becomes, or it becomes the OCI configuration and it's part of the runtime. The OCI runtime spec defines what's in that JSON file as well as what's in the root FS. So it says you put a root FS on the system, you put this JSON file between it, and now I launch an executable that understands the JSON and configures the system. Docker Inc. Uh, basically gave the first tool to do that called Run C. So Run C was the first implementation, or so the de facto implementation of the OCI runtime specification. Just about every tool that runs containers now in the universe uses Run C to create the container. Okay, so Run C. So this is the steps that you needed to do uh, to run a container on your box, right? Everybody agree with that? Anything missing? Okay, so we don't need a big fat container demon to do all those steps. And I have, I'm a big pusher against the big fat container demon because the big fat container demon, here we are five years into containers and there's only one way to run containers. Everybody knows it. If I ask you how do you pull an image, you tell me the deep pull. If I ask you how to push it, you say deep, how do you build it, deep build. And everything goes through this one image. The problem with the big fat container that is, the biggest problem with it is we get least common denominator of security. So needing to build a container is much different than needing to run it in production. I need a lot more privileges to be able to write to the container image than I do to, to basically when I want to run it, say, under Kubernetes. Um, so what we want to do is basically take these pieces apart and reassemble them and redo different types of tools for running containers, uh, each one with the least privilege. Now later on there's going to be a talk that talks about some of the security features that we've been able to do by breaking apart the big fat container demon. I work for OpenShift, so everything that I do tends to be either for open source or I am instructed to do, to do it for OpenShift. So when I look at what OpenShift needs to do to run containers, OpenShift is Red Hat's Kubernetes, uh, you know, our enterprise version of Kubernetes, really what OpenShift is, plus plus. Okay, we have other features and other things we've added onto Kubernetes, but basically if you want to get, if you come to Red Hat and you want to buy uh, Kubernetes from us, we will sell you OpenShift. Shift. So what does OpenShift and Kubernetes need to run a container? They need those f first four things, but they need CRI. So there's so a little story here. CoreOS again. CoreOS came along and they wanted to, uh, the original version of Kubernetes embedded Docker all over the place inside of the code. Uh, CoreOS came along and they said, we want to support Rocket inside of Kubernetes. So they wrote huge patch sets and Kate basically sent them upstream to Kubernetes that basically said, if def Rocket do it this way, else do it the old way. Um, and the Kubernetes develop, the developers at the time of the upstream Kubernetes said, wait a minute, we can't do this. Because if we do this for Rocket, then all of a sudden uh, uh, Garden or some other container uh, engine is going to come along and say, uh, we want you to support our container runtime as well. So what Kubernetes did is they wanted to turn it on its head. And they basically said, you guys implement a small daemon and we will talk to it. And we will talk to that thing called via CRI, so container runtime interface. So Kubernetes to find an interface that it will talk to container engines with, and then if the container engine implements it, Kubernetes will very happily do that. Next thing that Kubernetes needs to do when it talks to a container engine is it wants to tell the CRI that it needs, well, it's going to tell the CRI it needs a container image, 
CRI needs to pull the image from the container registry, needs to store it on top of a copy on write file system, and finally needs to execute an OCI runtime. Anything look familiar from the first part? So we have all these tools. Another one of my uh, members of my teams, when this happened, um, basically said, you know, we could take our standard building block tools here and build our own CRI. And that thing was called Cryo. So CRI, O, so the CRI stands for Container Runtime Interface for Kubernetes, and the O stands for Open Containers, or OCI, Open Container Images. So we developed a small, lightweight daemon that basically just implements what's needed for Kubernetes uh, to run containers in the environment, and we called it Cryo. So Cryo is an OCI base, I already said that. Uh, so scope is totally tied to Kubernetes. The CRI only supported useless containers for Kubernetes, nothing more, nothing less. Let me beat this to death. Cryo loves Kubernetes. Kubernetes is it. Cryo is a, you know, she's very loyal to her man. She's never going to go anywhere. She might get, Mesosphere comes in and says, you know, starts getting cute around her and stuff like that, but she says no friggin' way. And we got here, Definitely not, not even in the ballpark. This, no way. And definitely not, okay? Cryo is only, all she cares about is Kubernetes, okay? It's just Kubernetes. So overview of additional components. So there are additional things we needed to be able to do cryo, um, and we'll talk a little bit about those. So one of the things we needed to do was basically translate the input from Kubernetes. Kubernetes has its own specification of what it wants to do to run a container, yeah, but we have to translate that specification to OCI runtime specification. So there happened to be a tool inside of OCI called OCI runtime tools, actually written by one of my guys, but basically you can take input from users, a library that'll take input from users and generate an OCI runtime specification. Um, so we use that inside of Cryo. Next thing we need to use is this thing, again, CoreOS comes along. Um, we needed a way to configure networks. So networks is kind of a strange part of this whole uh, container world in that we needed networks to, you know, we want to allow different virtual private network tooling to come along and build and be able to plug into the container environment. There's lots and lots of companies building their own sort of uh, either hardware-based or software-based container networking. I um, mean, so CoreOS has defined a standard called CNI, which is Container Networking Interface, uh, to use to allow other people to plug in. And so they've, it's been used with Flannel Weave, Open Daylight, Open SDN. I think uh, uh, OpenShift has their own version. Uh, so lots and lots of people are building uh, container networking interfaces. Lastly, to run containers, we need a way to monitor the container. So when I launch a container on the system using an OCI runtime, it just goes out and uh, configures the kernel, you know, those uh, C groups and security settings and namespaces, launches the process and then goes away. So at that point, there's nobody watching the container. There's nobody sitting out there saying, did the container exit? Right, or trapping it, and, and, and so we needed a tool to be basically watch the container, um, and basically that's called Conmon. We wrote it in C because we wanted it to be as lightweight as possible, and it basically monitors, it takes care of logging, what's the output, so when you run containers, you usually watch what's out, going to standard out and standard error. Um, it handles the TTY, it service, uh, serving attached clients, and it detects OOM. Basically, it figures out if the container died, and then writes the status to a file, so that now any container engine that comes up can actually go to Conmon and basically figure out what happened, or if, you know, Conmon will exit with the container, but it'll record the data that happened. So the pod architecture, when you're running Kubernetes um, in, in your environment, Kubernetes runs pods, it doesn't run containers. Now contain pods are basically one or more containers running together. And, and the pod is also this idea of what's called an infra container uh, or a pause container. And what happens when you launch a pod under Kubernetes is it launches this little tiny container program that basically goes to sleep. And it just starts up and then it attaches all those namespaces to it. You have to have a process in the original namespace and then it will add containers to it. So if you looked at a, under cryo, what happens when you launch a pod, we launch the infra container, it has one con on listening to that, and then one or more containers gets launched. So basically, this is what the whole infrastructure of uh, uh, pod infrastructure under Cryo. Um, so uh, we talked earlier about how much Cryo loves Kubernetes, and the way we're trying to prove that is basically we have the biggest test suites. Every test suite we can find 
we run before anything gets merged into, into cryo. So we don't want cryo to ever break. No new features ever break Kubernetes. So right now we're running, uh, I don't know, it's, it's probably much more than 500, but there's nine full test suites. To get a pull request into, into cryo at this point is pretty difficult, right? You have to jump through hoops. You have to make sure that everything is possible state. No PRs emerged without everything passing. Uh, cryo came out, was fully supported as of last December. Uh, one dot, uh, they, my engineers wanted to call it 1.0, so we released it uh, back in December. I hated the fact that we called it 1.0, so the next release we called it 1.9, which works with Kubernetes.1.9. Then we hit released 1.10, which works with Kubernetes 1.10. Anybody uh, has a guess what works with 1.11? Uh, yeah, okay, so 1.11 works with Kubernetes 1.11. We are stocking the hell out of Kubernetes, okay? Um, the goal uh, right now, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a minute, but basically the goal for OpenShift 4.0 is that uh, we'll support cryo by default. Right now we support both cryo and Docker under the covers, um, but the, the, the goal is at 4.0 to support cryo by default. Um, Cryo is now supporting, is now running uh, most, uh, a lot of OpenShift Online. So if you go on OpenShift Online, you're using Cryo. If you go to Microsoft and you want to launch a Kata container, you're using Cryo. Okay, so Cryo is actually getting out there. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I always tell people, I want Cryo to be something you ignore, right? The real goal here is to make running containers in production boring. Okay. I often ask people, they say, all right, do you use this in the back end? Do you use this in the back end? And I ask them, what file system do you use? I don't know what file system I have on my laptop. Is it ext4? Is it XFS? I don't know, and I don't care. The only time I care is when something breaks. And so our goal here is to make this thing just blend into the background. It's just a, it's just a feature underneath Kubernetes. So what else does OpenShift need to do to run containers after it runs, you know, uses Kubernetes? Well, it needs the ability to build images. OpenShift has this concept called source to image, where a user just checks something into Git, does a push, and all of a sudden the container poops out the back end of the OpenShift, right? So we need that container image to, to come out of the end. Um, so we needed a way to, to support that for OpenShift. And we need the ability to push these things to container registries. So this guy right down here is Alan Dibai, uh, is working with me last year at uh, DevConf Check, and uh, we're sitting there together, and he's in charge of containers image. And I always kept on saying to him that I need a tool for building containers. I wanted core utils for building containers. I said, you know, it's just a rootfs. I need to create a rootfs, tie it up, tie up some JSON file, put it together, and build it. And I said, I need some copy and write. I said, you got that. You got uh, containers image. Could we throw together something to do that? I told him that in the morning uh, while we're at DevConf, and by that evening he did a five-minute talk showing how he would build uh, container images using container storage. And uh, so he said, "What do you want me to call it?" I said, "I don't care what you call it. Just call it Builder. What what difference does it make?" And then he came out with this. <laughs> And so we, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the last thing here, this is not the current image, but the, this image was the first image we put out of it. This is a Boston Terrier, in, supposedly in a hot hat. As soon as we tweeted out that we had an a icon for this, people came back and said, why do you have a dog with tidy whities on his head? <laughs> so I still live with it. It's, it's, it's much more of a hot hat nowadays, but I like to leave it just for that joke. Okay, so uh, in the coloring book that hopefully you guys picked up, if you don't, come and get me afterwards. This is the builder um, is represent, represented as as a dog, and I think it kind of looks like Nalan, don't you? <laughs> okay, so builder came along, and, and again, it's my my idea was core core utils for containers. Uh, we wanted to have a simple interface for it. So you know, we needed to be able to pull an image from a, contain from a container registry to the host, and so we built Builder from Fedora. So what this does is it goes out and uses that container image to go out to a container registry, pulls down the Fedora image off of the container registry to the local system, puts it on top of container storage, and then creates a Builder container. Okay, container is a way overused word in this world, but basically it has all the data that's associated with a container. And the next step we need to do is we need to mount the container, right? I want a mount point. Point. I want that root of fest mounted on my system, and I just want to be able to write to that root of fest. Um, so we built build a mount, and that basically brings back a mount point. Okay, another segue. Anybody ever hear of this command? 
Anybody know what this command does? It copies content from a container image to the host. Well, I would copy stuff from the container, from the host, into a container image. Really cool, huh? Really cool. I saw that and I said, I'm going to steal that idea. So I decided to go off and build my own tool, and I called it Copy. <laughs> and I put it into Core Utilities on the system, and I built it. You know, it, it, it really you know works really well. But once I saw that work really well, I decided to build another tool. So I built a tool called DNF. Sometimes you call it YUM. I used to call it YUM. I might call it YUM again in the future. But basically, with this tool, you can actually install content into a container root defense. So I just added dash dash install root, and you can basically install Apache into a empty root FS and do it. Um, but I said, that's cool. I'll invent another tool. I invented a tool called Make. So with the tool Make, I can actually do this thing called Dester. I decided to come up with this concept of Dester, and I could basically set it up to point to a root FS. So basically what I'm showing here is you can basically use anything on a Linux system to actually populate what's going to go into your container. So the next thing you need to do is populate that JSON associated with the container image, and we have a tool called Build a Config. And so you can put things like entry point, environmental variables, all this different stuff that you basically um, uh, put into a container's image to identify in, uh, what the container is. Um, and then finally, we want to take that container image and actually have I mean, a container and, and create an image, right? Create an OCI image on the system. And so that's build a commit. And then, of course, I want to be able to push it somewhere, push it to a container registry, so we have build a push. So with this tooling, uh, and by the way, all this stuff here, no big fat container daemon, right? I don't need a daemon to do any of this stuff. So I can do it. Not only that, I'm showing it's running as root here. With, rate, with the current um, builder, we can do it as non-root. We can do all this stuff. Taking advantage of using namespace, we're able to do this all as non-root now. Simultaneous. Simultaneous. All right. Well, you got to try it again. Everybody at the same time. One, two, three. Glad you asked. <laughs> So Builder also has to support Dockerfile, okay? Dockerfile has become this sort of de facto standard. I like to think of it as a really crappy version of Bash, but, or, you know, shell script. Uh, but basically, it's become this de facto that everybody wants to support. So we actually had to support, with Builder, support using Dockerfile. So we built a command called build, Builder using Builder, Build using Dockerfile, and basically has the same syntax that you would expect for running um, builds on it. Uh, but of course, we're engineers, so we're all lazy, so we actually have Builder. Uh, so build a bud, and no, you know, Anheuser Busch is not involved in this decision. But basically, um, we can build container images using Docker files. Well, it's not called build a file, but I decided to write this really nice scripting language, and I called it Bash. Uh, <laughs> So after I wrote Bash, I basically have uh, you know lots and lots of tools out there to build container images. And the whole idea here is that what I really wanted with Builder is to basically provide a library or, or, or low-level command line tools that other people could build higher-level contain, uh, container languages. So we want others to build it. Uh, we're looking at OpenShift is looking to basically as, as, uh, replace uh, right now the source, source to image is actually injecting the Docker socket into the containers. Um, to run, uh, to, to do builds. Uh, a lot of times I tell people that that is probably the most insecure thing you can possibly do. If you want to give people access to the, to the, I tell you to just go in and set sudo to known root and turn off your logging. Because if you give a non-root user access to that socket, that's what you're doing. If I go and do evil things on a system as via, via the Docker socket, I can then destroy my container, and there's no record of me ever doing anything on your system. So never give out that socket to a non-privileged user. Um, so what we want to do with source to image is basically stop injecting that. Lots and lots of people are out running container builders inside of, inside of Kubernetes, and what they're doing is they're volume mounting in that socket. Okay, which is equivalent of giving them root on any host that they're doing it. So we want to be able to do builder inside a source to image and stop injecting the socket. Uh, Ansible containers is also looking at potentially using builder to replace and basically using um, Ansible as your sort of your Ansible playbooks for defining what's in a container image. 
So what else does uh, open shift need to do? We need the ability to diagnose problems. We need people to be able to play in this environment. Um, um, so we decided to create this new tool, and we called it Podman. So Podman um, is part of the LibPod effort. So we wanted to build, basically build a pod manager or a container managing tool, and we wanted to um, Basically, this tool is just a CLI, command line tool, that can be used for managing container images, and we based it on top of what everybody knows, which is a Docker CLI. So Podman um, is now out. We're actually releasing Podman on a weekly basis. We've been doing it for probably the last six months. Um, just okay, Podman 8.3. Um, so we release it. Uh, 8 is the month and the third week. Um, so at the end of the year, we're going to be in trouble. So we have to have 1.0 by the end of the year because we can't keep our naming system going. Um, but basically, you want to list the containers on the system. If you want to run a container on the system, if you want to exec into an existing container, um, if you want to uh, list the images out on the container, um, basically we've tried to copy everything in that CLI possible that we care about. Obviously, we're not doing swarm with this command, but we've had most of the commands are all done in lots and lots of people. And there was a great tweet that came out um, back about, uh, now I guess it's back in uh, May, uh, and I love this tweet. He says, I completely forgot that two months ago I set up an alias of Docker equals Podman, and it has been a dream. So he's been running for two months at this point without use, with Podman. And of course, that's a several month old one. So the next question down comes down and says, only downside uh, is no book. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, next one's uh, down. Joe Thompson replies and says, so who remind, how did you remind, figure out that you were running um, Docker and, I mean, Podman instead of Docker? And uh, he said, I executed Docker help, and it came out with Podman help. And I think I owe about three quarters to <laughs> so, so what I'd advise you to do right now is go home, try this out. Try out Podman. It's available on Fedora, RHEL, CentOS, uh, Ubuntu, um, and it's uh, fully supported on SUSE, OpenSUSE as well. So it's, it's basically gone out. Uh, we have lots and lots of contributors to it. And guess what? No big fat container demon, okay? It works like a fork and exec. It works sort of exactly what you expect. Not a client server operation, but Podman is really, really cool and does almost everything you can. So we talked a lot about containers. I've handed out the coloring book before. Um, and I think I'm just about to run out of space. So we have two other talks this afternoon. Uh, Nalan's going to be giving a talk, and I'm sure going back and attacking me. Uh, so I'm, he's going to give a, a deep dive into Builder. And then um, Urvashi and Sally O'Malley are going to be talking about all the different... I said that there's lots of security stuff that we're able to do by breaking apart containers. So they're going to be talking about that this, later on this afternoon. So look for those talks. Um, you can take the photo of this, and uh, the presentation will be there. I can add, I'll answer. Uh, one question, I guess. Yes. Is there any tool currently that can update a tag on a remote on, on a container or remote registry? Any tool? Actually, someone asked for that. And the answer is that has to be built into the container protocol. Container, basically, the protocol that talks between the client and the server. Uh, and Vincent's raising his hand back there because he's going to point out that they're working on a standard now to define that. So, th th is that what you're going to tell me, Vincent? Yeah. The the um, the. You can drop a coin in the Docker Registry API, not the Docker Registry code base, but the Docker Registry API yeah. has now been donated to the OCI, the Open Containers Initiative, as the distribution spec. Uh, it is the API that would enable a feature like that, but it's not really up, up to the client tools right now. They would have to do some shenanigans like fetch the image and then retag it and repush it. So that would be the place to look for it. OCI, uh, open container slash distribution spec. Right. So we actually, we had a big bug report that someone asking for that in Scopio, but we have to get it into, you know, we needed to get it into Quay and, and Artifactory and Docker IO. And so we really need that to be a standard how you interact with the container registries to be able to do something like that. Um, anybody else? Everybody loves this idea, and they're all aliasing it on their machines right now. Excellent. All right. Anybody want to talk to me? I'll be around, um, and thanks for coming.